you know, if you actually think about when older people like me, I won't say old, older people like me went through this process, the situation was very different. And I'll tell you it's because when we thought about the GME environment in general at that time, there were really only two main issues that people talked about. And they, they were these two issues. What was the education and how was that balanced out by service? Was I always just doing work or were they going to try and teach me? And those were really the only two components of the residency program environment that we talked about. Well, as you'd guess, things have probably changed. If you go back and you look at the literature going into the late 70s and into the 80s, there were a number of studies done where people actually looked in different specialties, different populations, you know, what is it that people applying to residencies really thought were important? And if we look through these individual studies, we'll see that a few key things came into play. And that's what I've put up here for you. For al almost all students, geographic location is key. You know, some of us have spouses or family, specific places we want to be. And then the other things you can see on this list really had a lot to do with the curriculum and the content of what was being taught in that residency program. And we see at the bottom there, perception of house staff satisfaction. And that's probably because it was a surrogate in general for what they thought that it would be like to work in that environment. Well, a lot of things happened from the early 80s into today's GME environment. And especially through the 90s, these big issues came into play when you look at residencies. And some of you may have even experienced them at your own institutions. But the federal government struggled to say, what exactly is a resident? Is a resident a student or is a resident an employee? Because especially from an IRS perspective, that makes a difference in the way you're taxed. So the, that struggle came out. What followed that was this whole issue then, when the, once the federal government decided that, yes, you are an employee, the next issue came, well, then why can't we unionize? So in many states, residents started unionizing. But the biggest thing that's probably changed people's perspective about the GME environment is that last one, and that's about duty hours. You're all in this new era of duty hours. I trained right before that came into play. So, you know, in my four-year OBGYN residency, I missed a full one year of sleep is the way I figure it. So. How did this change then how you as students then thought about applying into a residency and the things you looked at? Well, an interesting th hap thing happened uh, at the same time all of these changes were happening, and that is that people actually started thinking differently about what specialty they wanted to go into. And that's when this whole issue of controllable lifestyle started to come into play as far as which specialty people wanted. You guys have probably heard about the E-Road. Does that sound familiar to you? So this is emergency medicine, radiology, ophthalmology, uh, anesthesia, and dermatology. Those are the controllable lifestyle specialties. So that means this, that it gives you control over the balance that you commit to your professional pursuits versus your, uh, I won't say unprofessional, but your life outside of work, right? And this started to play a big role in the way people chose their specialties. And the question became, then did it also play into how people looked at the type of residency that they went into? So as before we only thought about the balance of education and service, people started thinking very seriously about resident well-being and what was the actual nature of the environment in which I'll train outside of education and service. So I became interested in this issue when I was a fellow and I wanted to know, well, if we're in this new era now of resident duty hours and people are so concerned about resident well-being, how does that impact how students then look at residency programs? And I was very fortunate to be involved with the AAMC when I was a fellow, and we did a national study. We were able to survey every fourth year student right after they submitted their rank order list. We surveyed them through EROS, and we asked them these questions. What were the key factors you guys looked at when you applied for residencies and when you made your rank order list? And we had thousands of students participate in this survey. So here's what they told us. The, thing, the key things that they thought were important were all related to that third thing, and that was the concept of resident well-being, how they would be treated in the residency program. You can see geographic location still was pretty high, but the other things that we used to think were very important to people, like the curriculum, the academics, those all fell into the middle tier of factors. You all are laughing. You think that's funny, huh? But this just tells you that right after duty hours were implemented, that's what people were thinking about and trying to evaluate when they were choosing residency. 
And the things that really were at the bottom of this list were those that had to do with things like support services, cost of living, some of the things some of you have mentioned today. Well, after we did this study, the NRMP decided it was such a good idea, they started doing this every other year. And so they started surveying applicants like you uh, right after the match. And so if we look at the most recent data, so our study was 2004, and this is now from the 2011 data. I'm going to break this down for you. If you look at for the people who participated in the matches then in 08, 09, and 2011, you'll see that things have once again changed. Once duty hours had penetrated and that had become the expectation for the residency environment, what you see is a change once again where people are no longer evaluating that when they go and look at residency programs. It's a standard expectation that this is the way it's going to be. I'm going to work a max of so many hours. And thankfully, what we're seeing is that academic reputation is once again rising to the top. People actually care about what they're going to be taught, not just how much they work. So that's good. Now, if you think about the learning culture then, okay, you all are saying, you know, I want to go to a place where I'll be taught well. What are the key factors that determine how well you're going to be taught? And as I counsel medical students, there are a few common themes that come up. And I want to t challenge you to try and define what these differences are. What do you think the difference is between academic rigor versus malignancy? You know, in my mind, the real difference here is that there's a lot of places where they will hold you accountable, but it's not necessarily for your benefit. They'll really try to hold you accountable and create a hierarchy and say this is your role and make sure you stay in that realm. And that's very different than a place that's going to genuinely care about you and hold you accountable so that you are pushed to perform the best that you can. And that's the real difference and hopefully when you go and look for a residency program you're going to look for a place that's going to invest in you and push you. You don't necessarily want a place where they're very nice but they never hold you accountable. Right? That's not ideal either because you can have a wonderful uh, relationship with all of your fellow residents, with the faculty, but if they never challenge you, then you aren't necessarily going to end up with the kind of learning that you wanted. Now another key thing that I think you have to look for in the learning culture is this, the balance between autonomy and supervision. The way I see this really play out a lot is especially in procedural specialties. A lot of procedural residencies, like surgery or OBGYN, other surgical residencies, they'll advertise a ton of autonomy. And they'll say, look, we're going to get you in the OR right away and you're going to start operating. The key question for you to ask is, well, who is actually going to be teaching me? Because if the person who's teaching you a procedure is only a year or two ahead of where you are, you can understand that they don't have a wealth of experience to draw from. They don't have a tremendous more amount of surgical expertise than you do. So whereas a, a program can say, we have a ton of autonomy, the lack of supervision isn't going to help you. On the other hand, if they say, well, you know, we give you a lot of supervision, if that means that the um, attending does most of the case, then that's not helpful to you, is it? So there has to be a good balance there. And don't get fooled by the people advertising autonomy. The, the third key thing I think you guys need to think about is this difference between a role model and a mentor. You know, this often comes into play, especially when you're looking at these big name institutions. And they might have these wonderful faculty who are NIH funded, doing great research, and you're like, man, I want to be like that person one day. But the question you should ask yourself is, will I ever actually see their face? Will I ever have any substantive interaction with them so that they will impact my career and my professional development? Because they can be a great role model for you in the way they've conducted their life and their career, but if they never engage with you, then they're not ever going to mentor you. And you have to try and figure out that difference. Well, as we launch into this idea of what's you know, important, I think it's important for us to think about, you know, how does the program look at this? If I'm going to be applying to programs, what are they looking at when they see me? And the best way for you to figure that out is to look at this, which is the uh, program director survey. So the NRMP, along with surveying applicants, has started to survey residency program directors. And they've asked them, tell us what the factors are in selecting applicants for interviews. And here's what we can find out if we look across the several years that they've done this. Now, these are a lot of different things, but you can see at the very top, 
is your USMLE Step 1 score. In fact, the way the EROS system is set up, programs actually can filter your applications based on your Step 1 score, and that's usually their primary <coughs> filter. If you want to know what it takes to make the cut, then, you just have to look here. So you can say that 99% of programs factor in the USMLE Step 1 score in deciding whether to interview you or not, and only 1% did it. And then the second part says, would your program consider applicants who fail their exam on the first attempt? And you can see that only 13% of those surveys said that they would still consider that person. So whether you like it or not, that step one score is really key to you getting an interview. Furthermore, it also determines where you're going to get an interview. It determines, it's based on the competitiveness of that program. So here they ask them, well, what's the score below which you generally will not grant an interview? And so that box plot tells you what the range of the score is. This is the 25th percentile line and the 75th percentile line. The straight line in the middle is the median and the X is the mean. So you can see overall for step one score across all specialties, this was the range, 25th to 75th percentile, where you'd pretty much be certain to get an interview. Certainly below that 25th percentile, so below about 200, it would be difficult to even get an interview at many programs. And then scores of which, of, above which programs always grant interviews, you can see it moves up a little bit higher for step one and the same, same for step two. You can also look at this based on specific specialties. So I'm OBGYN, so I can see that compared to the overall plot, we can see that OBGYN probably is not as competitive because we can see that the 25th and 75th percentile move a little bit lower uh, for that specialty. So, for those of us who are going to go through this process, I think that the key for you as you're thinking about this starting up is you have to look at all of these issues here. I think the key thing is at the very top, and that is setting a timeline. So here are the things that you should know about as far as basic dates. In mid to late June, that's when this uh, EROS user guide is going to become available. July 1st, that website's going to be opened up for you to use. September 15th is probably the most critical date for all of you, and, that's, and I'll explain why that is, but that's the date when residency programs start downloading applications, and I'll explain in more detail why that's so important. As far as setting a timeline, you have to go and make sure you know those dates, know all the components of the application process, and then I would recommend you pull out your calendar and set specific dates for yourself for when you're going to accomplish each of these tasks. The next thing you should do is gather some data. So I've already told you about some of these uh, reports that are available. You should, as soon as you know which specialty you're going to pursue, go to the nrmp.org website and download these three reports. Now the charting the outcomes in the match report is actually very critical and I'll show you more detail from that. The uh, latest edition for the 2013 match is not yet available, so you'll just have to wait. It should be available by the summer. But then certainly go and pull the other two reports that I've told you about. Now this charting the outcomes in the match report is going to be very helpful to you as you decide just how competitive you are for a specialty. And there are a couple key things that you'll want to look at. The first is this. And what it does is it tells you what the match rates are across all specialties for both U.S. seniors and then independent applications. So that wouldn't really apply to you, but that would be <coughs> foreign medical graduates. And what this basically tells you is what's the relative competitiveness of specialties. Some of you coming into med school may have had your heart set on a specific specialty, but based on your performance, maybe that door had closed for you. This is the way for you to decide that by looking at the relative competitiveness. Since we said that USMLE Step 1 score was really the first thing that programs look at, that's what this chart then will show you uh, within that report. And it'll show you across all specialties what is the mean USMLE Step 1 score for those students who successfully matched into that specialty. So I can see you straining your eyes to try and look at this, but this is really critical, right? So you can see, for example, for us in OBGYN, that mean score was 220. The next thing that report will do is it'll break down then the distribution of scores for all students who matched into every single specialty. So you can see the most common 
uh, range for step one scores for OBGYN would have been in this 221 to 230 range, and you see the distribution. So I see some of you giggling. This is really important because it, again, helps you establish how competitive an applicant you are for each specialty. They do the same thing here for step two scores, although you saw from the prior chart that that's not as important to residency program directors. And again, they'll break that out across all applicants. So gather your data, determine your competitiveness. The next thing you want to do is look at what are the components of the application process. And uh, we're going to go through each one of these. I think the good question for you all to think about is, should you do an extramural elective? So here is my bias about this whole thing, OK? And I'm going to just tell you from having advised many students about it. Electives can be both good and bad. And you've already heard the point that they are truly extended interviews. You're there for a month, and every single day you're being interviewed. And that's because the faculty, but especially the residents who are working with you, are going to have input about if you get an interview at the place and then where you'll be on that rank list. I think that in general, the fourth year away rotations are best for the very strongest of students and then the very weakest of students. And here's why. If you're very strong, you're going to get interviews wherever you want. They're going to want you. And so from your perspective, what you need to do is decide, again, what's the learning environment? Are there role models or mentors? Are they going to, is it rigorous or is mal malignant? And you need to go and evaluate those characteristics of the program. On the other side, if you're a very weak student, like some of you are looking at those USMLE Step 1 scores and saying, ugh, you know, where do I rank on that for that specialty I want? You need to go and do an away elective because that may help you get an interview at a place where might, that might have been a reach for you. And again, regardless, you have to be there on your A game. You can't go and be distracted and not expect that people would notice that. And you have to avoid that. If you find yourself to just be a solid candidate, I think you really have to think about the other factors. It's time away. It's going to be expensive. You may have to buy an additional malpractice rider when you go. You'll have to find a place to live, travel, all of those things. Factor that in and ask yourself, you know, do I really want to go and do that if I'm pretty much sure that I can get an interview at most of these places? So think about that carefully before you uh, launch into it. The next step for you then is going to be thinking about the whole application process through EROS. And you can go now to the EROS website and start reading up and learning what you need to start collecting. In general, that EROS application has four main components. The identifiers, your educational history, and your current and prior training are pretty straightforward. The thing where you should focus your time on now, even before EROS becomes available, is compiling your experiences. And think about the breadth of the things that you do, not just things that you do at school, but even outside of school. I'm sure many of you have done activities with your church or been on missions, been involved with nonprofit organizations. And don't just list that as a title. Be able to write one or two sentences to effectively describe your role in that activity. And what people are really looking for is, were you just a participant, or were you someone who was a leader, an organizer, and contributed substantively to that work? Now, the next big thing that residency programs look for is the personal statement. So why do residency program directors care so much about the personal statement anyway? I'll tell you why. It's a very practical reason. Most of the faculty who interview you on interview day, they don't even read your application. The only thing they might look at is your personal statement. And what they're doing is they're fishing for things to ask you about during the interview. Because most interviews, unfortunately, in my opinion, are very unstructured. So think about that when you're writing it. You want to provide things for them to ask you about and things that will be memorable. And so here are just uh, some of my suggestions based on experience. Number one, first check with the program for any special content requirements. Depending on which specialty you go into, some may want to be very directive in what you include. Some may even ask you, well, tell us what your research goals would be in the personal statement. So especially if you're going into some of the more subspecialties, that's very important for you to do. The next point here is, even now, line up reviewers for yourself and try to get a broad perspective, okay? Not just people who are in the medical field, but people who are outside of medicine, and someone who's just very good with English composition that's going to help you make sure that it reads well and there aren't errors. 
And then the last thing there is be prepared to write many drafts. I remember writing my personal statement, and I probably had 20-some drafts. And actually, I did give you a sample. The very first one in there is mine from 1998. So you can see how that reads. So here's some other advice for you on what to include. These are all just suggestions. So it might be reasonable for you to think about a motivation for a career in medicine or how you chose the specialty and why you're such a good fit for it. Really think about distinguishing features of your personal or professional background and your unique qualities. I really like to see in personal statements someone present a vision of what they expect to be once they're done with residency. Have you even thought about that and can you think that far into the future? You know, I think you brought up a great point about how do you give a testimony about your faith and I'll tell you that my opinion about that has changed a lot from when I, before I was a true follower of Christ till afterwards and I would have told you when I was a medical student oh don't ever put anything about your faith into your personal statement but I'll tell you that what you said is very true that if it's what you strongly believe in and it's a passion in your life then you should be free to talk about it and if it's a place that doesn't appreciate that that's a good way for you to test them to see if it's even an environment that you'd like to be in. So what to avoid. I think that's just about as uh, important in terms of telling you what to include. You never want your personal statement to be an autobiography. So you don't want to say I was born in, you know, Bryson City, North Carolina, and I went to this elementary school. You know, that's not the kind of personal statement people are going to want. You also don't want to try and talk about why you like a specific program. You know, I, the personal statement is not to be about the program, it's about, to be about you. And then avoid these last three points that I've put there about a poorly written statement. This will kill you. If I ever see a statement that's poorly constructed, has typographical errors, for me that's a great commentary on the kind of person you are and how much effort you put into it. So at the very least, you should avoid that kind of an error. Now the next thing I want to talk to you about is the best strategy for letters of recommendation because this was the next thing that program directors said that they looked at. And just for uh, time purposes, I'm not going to get so much feedback from you folks. But here's what I'm going to tell you as far as my advice, okay? Number one, again, go and check with the individual programs because some may be very prescriptive about the kinds of letters that they want. They may say they want one from the chairman, for example. They may say they want them all from within the specialty. So those are questions that you need to find out for individual programs. The next thing is you need to ask early and ask often. You know, being a faculty person, I have, you know, dozens of other things on my to-do list. And I might say, yes, I'll do a letter for you. But unless you sometimes come back and remind me, by the way, I need it by this date, I may keep pushing it off. The last point, though, I think is the most critical for you to consider. You should never just ask someone to write you a letter of recommendation because that's not helpful. What you want to know is, are they going to write you a good letter of recommendation, right? And you want to know the strength of that recommendation. So here's the strategy that I'm going to tell you guys to do. Instead of going up to someone and saying, will you write me a letter or emailing them or texting them or however you communicate with your faculty, what you should do instead is, would you be willing to meet with me to discuss my application to residency and perhaps even talk about how you'd feel about writing a letter of recommendation for me. Go and have that appointment with them. Make it 30 minutes or longer if necessary. When you go to that meeting, you should become, you should be well prepared. And here's what I actually tell my faculty. Now, not all faculty do this, but I think you should do it as a student. You should provide that person with your personal dossier. You should give them all of these things in advance of that meeting, maybe a week or so in advance of that meeting. Give them your med school transcripts, your USMLE scores. Have your personal statement, at least a draft of it, in that binder also. And give them your CV. Have all of those sent to their office and then say, I'm going to meet with you on such a date. You can review these if you like. Okay? What I do then if a student does that, and I actually require them to do it, I'll look through it. And then I'll interview them and I'll say, look, I'm just going to pretend this is your residency interview and I'm going to make it as hard as I possibly can. And I'm going to ask you about things that are on your application that are very uncomfortable because it's better that I ask you and you come up with a good reason rather than you hearing it for the first time when you're out there interviewing. And so that's the kind of inter uh, interaction I have. And at the end of the meeting, I'll actually tell the student, here's how I'm going to write your letter and here's my strength of recommendation. 
either you know, you're the best student I've ever encountered in my life, or you're somewhere lower than that. And I'll actually tell them. And I'll tell them, and that's fair, right? And I'll tell them, I'll write this letter for you, but then you can decide if that's the kind of letter you want to submit with your EROS application. And I think that's fair, rather than you just being in the dark about it and not knowing what to expect. So in your packet, I've included some sample letters of recommendation that I've written for students who've had different characteristics, some academically strong, some not so, but other unique characteristics about them. And you'll see that my style is to write it more as a narrative about the person. As you think about, furthermore, who you're going to ask letters of recommendation from, I think you should think about what are my, the different ways I interact with people in my life. Some people may be able to comment very much on your clinical skills, on your academics. Some people may have worked with you in, in another domain and can comment about your leadership skills or your people skills. So think about that and try to get letters that represent the breadth of the person that you are. And then, of course, proofread. Another point I want to make to you is about the interview process. And a lot has changed in the last few years, and this is very important. This goes back to that September 15th date that I mentioned to you in the very beginning. If we look just as late as 2008, this graph basically shows you, you know, what percentage of positions were programs holding out prior to the release of the Dean's Letter, which they call the MSPE. That used to be released on November 1st. And you can see that, you know, at that point, 3.4% of programs said that they scheduled all of their interviews before they even got your Dean's Letter. Okay, well, what do you think it was in 2012? Things have changed a lot. And because of this, what the uh, AAMC and EROS have done is they've actually moved up the uh, Dean's Letter release date to October 1st because they realized that programs were scheduling these interviews without even getting information from EROS. So this is why September 15th is so critical. Programs download your application and literally within that first week or two, they'll start contacting the ones they want to interview and scheduling. A lot of programs are going to be done with their interviews, perhaps even by the end of December. A few may linger into January, but not so many anymore. So if you fail to get everything done by September 15th, even if you're an excellent applicant, you're already going to be behind because there may not be spots available for you. And so my overall advice for you on that is this, that schedule them early. Remember that the programs may fill very quickly. And don't, uh, I know, you, all of you would never make this mistake, but don't forget to be nice to every person you come into contact with, especially those residency coordinators, because they have a lot of say. Your application may magically get lost if they somehow had a negative interaction with you, so don't, uh, don't uh, underestimate that. It's never a bad idea to send thank you notes, but I find that faculty don't value them very much anymore. If I were going to write one thank you note, I'd send it to the residency coordinator because there's someone who could be an advocate for you in the long run. The next point I want to share with you guys is how should you determine your rank list order. And this is a really uh, difficult topic, I think. But some basic advice for you is that you should always rank based on where you want to be, not where you think you are liked. And there's a very simple principle that's at play in that the more programs you rank, the greater your match success is going to be. And here is some data from that same survey we did in 2004. And we asked students to tell us, how did you determine your rank list order? And so again, when it came time to you're done with interviews and now you're deciding where to put programs in order, they were again really looking at their fit and that learning environment to determine finally uh, where they wanted programs to be. And so when we asked them what was the single most important factor, you can see it was their potential fit into the residency and the geographic location. The NRMP has started to ask the same question more recently, so they asked what were your factors in ranking number one or number two, and you can see where things were uh, as recent as 2011. They also asked students what was your ranking strategy, and you can see most students said I ranked in the order of my preferences and the programs that I was willing to attend. I think pretty much everyone will tell you, don't ever rank a program where you know you'd never want to go there. Okay, you couldn't see yourself there. Okay. The other side you have to think about is how do programs determine their rank list order. And so the NRMP gives you that data too in their report. And here are the big threes. Once you get the interview, the next biggest thing that's going to determine where you land on that list is your actual interview performance. 
And what's come up more recently is a lot of programs are moving towards what they call behavioral interviewing. And some of you may be familiar with that. If you haven't, Google it, read about it on Wikipedia or something. But what behavioral interviewing allows them to do is not assess how smart you are, but how emotionally intelligent you are and how mature you are. And oftentimes, the questions then will be scenario-based. So they'll say, OK, so you're in a situation X with this patient. Tell us how you'd respond to it. Or there'll be questions about self-reflection. Tell me about the most difficult circumstance you've ever encountered in your life, how you dealt with it, and what you've learned from it. And those are really different questions than, oh, I had a friend who went to med school there, and that's a nice place, which is the other approach that some people take. So how many programs should you rank? And again, this should be data-driven. In that uh, report, the outcomes of the match report, it'll tell you for the, every specialty the number of ranked programs for those who successfully matched. And they'll furthermore, for every specialty, break it out and show you what the probability of matching is based on the number of contiguous ranks, so how long the rank list is. So you can see, for example, for OBGYN, if you wanted to have over a 90% chance of matching, then you want it to have about eight to 10 programs at a minimum on your rank list. Some of, for some of us, this isn't a possibility because we don't get enough interviews. But if you do get enough interviews, then just be thinking, this is the range where I want to make sure that I rank. So again, to review, these are the, the basic um, advice that I would give you. There's a number of uh, great resources for you guys to check out in addition to what you've heard here from the AAMC, and then of course there's some those reports that I want you to look at from the NRMP. Hopefully you all know about residency program databases like FRIDA and then the ACGME, and there's a bunch of other uh, references here. Some students do decide to buy some of these books, and I think that's never a bad idea. For example, this Iserson book, you know, he'll even tell you what to pack in your suitcase to take on interview day. So, you know, things that you may not have thought about. So you can check out some of those resources. Thank you.